Hello there, my fellow Blackstone Delvers, and welcome back to some 40k lore. Today we're gonna expand our Liber Xenologus playlist with another two Xenos races, namely the Galg, or Galg, and the Vespid. Now, we have actually covered the Vespid before, years ago at this point, but this book does offer a unique input and perspective on these topics, which is why I still think it's worth including Xenos we did cover before because in most of these cases it's not actual straight out info about them, it's stories involving them, which in many cases are actually more entertaining. That said, the Galg we never actually talked about before, and they are, as you're gonna find out today, at least in my opinion, one of the most interesting minor races of 40k. I am your host, the Rogue Trader GDN for today, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The Galg, or Aduminus Sextus. To quote, I had read of Galgs before arriving in the western regions, but it was not until I encountered some on precipice that I realized how widely misinterpreted the species has been. In Camargo's atrocious rag, De Morbis Zenoris, he manages to confuse coasps with crude, and even verls with urguls. Despite his claims of traveling the Imperium, I doubt Camargo ever left his library on Terra. And a very poorly stocked library that must have been. His inaccurate description of Galgs as green, frog-like creatures has been quoted as fact so many times that the Galgs themselves must be doubting the veracity of their own reflection. I recently encountered Galgs in Precipice's drinking den, the Helmsman. The creatures were not at all frog-like but they were certainly inhuman in appearance. In place of arms or legs, they had six tentacles that arrived as the Galgs slumped in their seats. The creatures had no heads, but they did have clusters of what I assume to be optical appendages. They seemed to stare at us with them while we approached their table. I had been keen to interview the creatures so that I might correct some of the untruths propagated by the Morbis Zenoris and Greg surprised me again by revealing that he was able to communicate with them. The Galgs had no mouth, but they produced a kind of whining moan as they moved their limbs, and it was very pleasant, a little like the sound of a glass harmonium. Incredibly, Greg was able to answer in kind, opening his beak as wide as possible, tilting his head back, and shaking the crest of spines that topped his head. The Galgs were excited to be addressed in their own tongue, and after exchanging what I assumed were Greg's clumsy equivalent of pleasantries, he was able to ask them some questions on my behalf. The Galgs told Greg that they originate from a planet called Adumin in the Ultima Segmentum, not far from the Eastern Fringe. They told Greg that they live in palaces built deep underground and illuminated by bioluminescent spores. The palaces are called Sums, and they are built under ceremonial mounds called Vafres. The Galgs believe that beneath the Sums dwells a malevolent race called the Maku, and if the Galgs do not lead a worthy life, they will descend into the realm of the Maku when they die. They described what seemed to be an idyllic world without war or need, that had stayed unchanged for thousands of years. But they became excited again when he described how Adumen had been irrevocably changed by the arrival of the Tao Empire. Rather than wasting their lives on idle pleasures and peaceful pursuits, the Galgs are now lucky enough to have a place alongside the Tao in a great project, to civilize and protect the Ultima Segmentum. Their excitement seemed baffling to me. They had been dragged from a peaceful idyllic existence into a war that had nothing to do with them, and they seemed ecstatic about it. But then again, that was not the first time I heard these tales about the Tao Empire. I had more questions ready for Greg to ask, when the Galg's mood soured. They suddenly launched themselves at Greg and began trying to strangle him. One of them drew a gun-like weapon and their gentle musical whine became an atonal scream. Firing weapons on precipice, especially somewhere as visible as the helmsman, can lead to exile or even execution. So things could have gone a lot worse. Fortunately, several drinkers nearby stepped in to help me free Greg while another snatched the Galg's gun. The Galgs would storm out, and once the crowd had dispersed, I asked Greg if he knew what had enraged them. 
He shook his head, and his tone was as neutral as ever. They asked me how I learned their language, Greg said. I explained that it was by eating their captain. Enlightenment flickered in his eyes. I don't think they knew that he died. I also found a bit more info on them from Lexiconum. According to some tellings of the events, the Gaugs joined the Tau willingly, happy to give up their lives of pleasure seeking to be given purpose by the greater good. Other sources say that the Gaugs were conquered or coerced into joining the Tau some centuries before the end of M41. Both accounts had been given credence by independent Galg mercenaries who roamed the wider galaxy, ever since Adumin's integration into the Tau Empire. Some Galg say that the Tau gave their species purpose and prevented them from wasting their lives, but others have organized as freedom fighters to overthrow Tau rule. This suggests that the encounter with the Tau might have split the entire Galg race into opposing factions. The Galg freedom fighters even joined the Alpha Legion warband the Sons of the Hydra, in their campaign to eradicate the Ultramarine successor chapters guarding the rimward edge of the Maelstrom in late M41. They took part in a successful ground assault against the Marine's Mordant Fortress Monastery, the Basilica on Vitrea Mundi. Here they fought alongside the Torellians, the Moralians, the Fraal, the Slith, and even Eldar outcasts, and they were united by seemingly a shared hatred of humanity. The use of different species was chosen to provide maximum strategic flexibility, and this extremely varied combat style made them very difficult even for the Marines' veterans to defend against. Other Galgs were encountered on Precipice and the Seventh Blackstone Fortress, where they would work as mercenaries for pretty much anyone. Physiologically, the Galgs are a race whose individuals resemble a mass of tentacles and a bulbous head. They are also described as having six tentacle limbs instead of arms and legs, and no head, but clusters of eye-like organs that wave like grass in a breeze. The young Galgs produce an oily secretion that is drunk by the Dark Eldar, giving them an invigorating effect and the occasional hallucination. When fighting in close quarters, the Gals have been known to latch onto the enemy's back and wrap their tentacles around their throats. The second part of this episode is dedicated to the Vespid. And I gotta warn you beforehand, you might want a box of tissues. The Vespid, or the Vesparum Mors. The Vespid are tall, winged humanoids that, to my eyes at least, bear a similarity to hornets with barbed chitinous carapaces, twitching antennae, and wings that emit a harsh droning sound. I have fought them twice, and on both occasions found them to be formidable. Their success on the battlefield derives from two particular factors. First, the sound and appearance of the Vespid has a severe impact on morale, unnerving even the most hardened fighter. The buzzing of their wings, their insect-like armor, and their grotesque six-eyed faces have a nightmarish quality that can rout men even before a single shot is fired. The second reason for their success is their advanced weapons. Grek, who has fought alongside the Vespid several times, tells me that their guns are produced by their overlords, the Tau, and I have seen even mighty space marines cut down by these Xenos warriors. As I mentioned earlier in this treatise, see the chapter on the crude, Greg has the ability to summon memories that he has subsumed from the prey he has eaten, claiming to digest the soul as well as the body to gain both spiritual and physical nourishment. He is a proud individual, in a rough kind of way, and is never keen to display this genetic quirk on demand. But when I described the Vespid as savage monsters, he showed an uncharacteristic flicker of emotion and then deign to share one of his digested memories with me. Greg is very clear on the fact that he has ever fought alongside the Tau for money. He takes pride in the status as a mercenary who has never adopted or even understood the Tau credo. He spoke of a time when he and the Vespid warrior by the name of Alupka became separated from the main Tau offensive, and they were trapped alone in a crevasse as dozens of greenskins poured from the mountains on either side of them. Greg sat erect, like he was on the parade ground, and he recalled how bravely Alupka fought. 
The two warriors had no shared language, but Greg told me that they needed no words, fighting with the seamless efficiency of comrades who have survived a long campaign. I confess, I found it odd to think of two such seemingly barbarous Xenos becoming loyal comrades, as humans might be, but that is how Greg described it. As the orcs reached the gully floor, Greg was wounded and fell to the ground. Alupka, seeing that they could no longer win the skirmish, lifted Greg in his arms, pounded his wings and launched them both into the air. With Greg's additional weight, Alupka could only fly at a low altitude and with great difficulty. As they flew towards the far end of the gully, the orcs fired a deafening barrage of shots and Alupka was hit. Greg could immediately see that the wound was serious, but Alupka continued trying to outrun the orcs. Greg paused at this part of the story and fixed me with those dark, blank eyes of his. He explained that if Alupka would have dropped him at that point, the Vespid could have gained altitude and escaped from the Greenskins. But Alupka clung on to Greg, even as several more shots punched into the Vespid. Greg could see that Alupka would surely die if he didn't drop him and he tried to wrestle free, but the Vespid would not let him go. By the time they left the orcs behind, Alupka was covered in wounds and was clearly dying, but he did manage to find enough strength to reach a high precipice and land out of sight of the enemy. Save for his earlier injury, Grek was relatively unharmed, but Alupka only managed a few more breaths before dying at Grek's feet. Greg paused again at this point and examined a piece of something attached to his own body armor, seeming to forget that he was in the middle of a story. I reminded him that he was going to share a stranger's memory with me, and Greg nodded, explaining that Alupka had proven to be such a brave, worthy soul that there was only one way he could honor him sufficiently. As the orcs scoured the mountains for them, Greg began to devour his comrade. As he ate, he gained what he referred to as insights. But he also claims to have witnessed Alupka's most endearing memory, a memory of the day he left his home. At this point, Greg's entire demeanor changed, and he spoke in a language and tone that I've never heard before. It was weeks before Isola's cogitator could translate my recording into the following words. She was unsure, even then, if the translation was accurate though but it is evocative nonetheless. Remember, the words describe the memory Greg claims to have absorbed out of Alupka. Greg told me that he learned many things from the Vespid comrade, including how it felt to abandon one's past. Finally weighed down by sadness I had seen, I alighted in the chambers of Bulata, where the wings once gathered in their mighty sieves, waiting to greet the Lucent as they returned from a load. I looked up into the distant vaults, recalling the sound of a thousand wings paying tribute to the mother's bravery. But now there was only silence. The sieves were gone, dispersed long ago on the orders of the Ethereals. And where there should have been mounds of tributes, there were only piles of dust. Once the Lucent had sworn allegiance to the Tau, what was the use in places like Bulata? The old customs had become meaningless. The Lucent no longer brought crystals for the sieves. They gathered them for the ethereals. I launched myself into the air, circled the chamber and tried to drag the old melody from my wings. But my soul was as empty as the hole, my heart as still as the dust. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to narrate for you on the Galg and the Vespid from the Liber Xenologus for today. I think we can all agree to offer a moment of silence for Alupka, the Vespid warrior. Gonna go on a bit of a tangent here, but how is it that I can become almost teary-eyed over a story that's two lousy pages long, featuring two aliens that would kill a human as soon as look at them, while something like the combined Star Wars trilogy, the sequels I mean for example, with a budget of about 700 million dollars put together left me pretty much cold. Anyway, if you can't tell, I actually really loved narrating these two stories, and I hope you enjoyed it too. Feel free to share your thoughts on it in the comments below. Thanks a lot for watching to the end, and the Emperor Protects.